you survive all this. Looking back, because there is a woman listening to this podcast going through hell with a narcissist, with an obsessive compulsive. She is being stalked by a husband or a boyfriend or by a private investigator hired by him. Looking back, what is the one thing you would tell people in that situation that you went through that you see clearly now? Focus on the things that you can control. You can't control him. You can't control what he does to you. And it's so easy to just zero in on, I can't believe he's doing this right now. I can't believe this is happening to me. What can you do? What can you control? Um, Whether it's educating yourself about family law and divorce. So, you know, if you're already separated, you can empower yourself or you're in the middle of it. What can you do to find freedom? What can you do to better yourself? And I don't say that lightly. I know how impossibly hard that is to do in the middle of it. But I spent so much time then just focused on what was happening to me and not focusing on what I could do. What was the truth of the situation? Because, you know, Kane would go on air, basically making it sound like he was this, you know, super dad. He had, and I, was this part true? So I guess he won custody, like of the girls. Like, what was that? What was the truth? No, he went on and on for years saying that he had custody of the girls. No, the, um, excuse me, the judge said that I needed to, so at that point I had probably 80% custody. You know, he had, you know, every other weekend, something like that. And the judge said, you go, you do your 30 days, you come back, I'm putting this right back where it was before. Because he was on the fence about whether or not to even do this or not. Meaning to have you um, have a rehab program, right? Or to- Yeah, do 30 days at a rehab rehab program, you come back and he- I read the transcripts, he literally said, I will put this right back where it was before. Um, But that- never actually happened. Um, It took, because you have to understand this is a man who was making at that point, like $2 million a year. And he was just inundating me with attorneys. And I had no idea how the family law system is. This is something I'm really passionate about now is about educating system about what your power and your rights actually are when you're going through a divorce, because you have more than you think. And I didn't know this at the time and I was always on the, on, on the back foot. And there were so many things I agreed to that I really didn't have to, but you know, you just get beaten down and terrified by these attorneys and the power of this man who's been able to control you. So um, no, we ended up, you know, he, his attorneys would pull all these moves of getting to push it out and push it out before we could go back before the judge to put custody back at where it was before, which was primary custody with me. And um, finally, I ran out of money and I couldn't fight anymore and I had to settle. Um, So we settled on, it was like a 60-50 split. Um, That never stopped him for years until the very end saying that he had like full custody. But no, it it ended up being like a 60-50 split um, because I just, and I was screaming that whole time like he needs help too, but nobody could hear me. (laughs) So. I finally, no, I, mean, I finally, you, for my own sanity and for just being able to finally stop and move forward, I finally just settled and um, just wanting it to be over. I mean, it lasted it, years. Isn't it discouraging though? I feel like our justice system, it just comes down to who has the most money. Oh, Don't you have think? no idea how isn't fucked it? the family law system is. It oh, is my brother went through it with my, with my niece. And it, it, you know, it just came down to, if if he ha- if my brother had had two million dollars, the outcome would have been totally different. You know, it's just yeah. if you are rich, it works. But I, you- I don't want to discourage women who are you know their husband was the breadwinner and now they're separated and they don't have the money. With knowledge, you can fight for yourself. I just didn't know back then how much power I actually had because you have these attorneys telling you like you know, writing motions. She's this horrible addict. She'll, you know, he was always saying that I had relapsed and this and that, which was 100% false. But, you know, you have, you received this court motion in the mail and it's written by an attorney, this powerful attorney. And it sounds like truth saying all these horrible things about you. And this is what they're going to tell the judge. And you get terrified. 
but it's all BS. That's just what they're paid to do. You do have a voice and you can go and fight this. Um, even if you have to represent yourself, um, there, and actually you, you should, have power. You can do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and lots of times yeah. you actually have a better outcome too, if you just get, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but there's, there's a lot to it, but, um, there are resources out there that I just didn't know about at the time. And, and I just got tired and I got broke. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it, it, so much. I mean, I'm sure he probably spent a million dollars fighting you, you know? Easily. I mean, you and I talked about this the other day. I mean, easily millions on attorney's fees over the years. Easily. It, it, you know, for a long time, I felt the same way as you, like nobody heard me because people, you know, I was... I was painted as the problem. Sammy was painted as the problem. We were painted for a long time by not just Kane, other other people around him, mm -hmm. um, as crazy as the problems, as you know, th this, that, and the other. Um, Sarah was this. Sarah was that. Um, you were painted in the same way. I would I would hear that about you. Did it bother you knowing he was out there telling everybody and anybody? And by the way, I would say to people, this man has a huge audience and microphone every day. So whatever angle he wants to take is what people are going to believe because he was forever going on the air. How, I mean, you know, your marriage, right? He was always talking about how great you guys were together, how great and the girls and how beautiful your family was. And he was a family man. And I mean, you know, and you know, he always had to be the hero on the radio show. Like Sammy or I had to be the villain, you know, it could never be him. Okay. Did Don't it you wish we had known the definition of gaslighting back then? Yeah. Like now, like my girls use it all the time. Like you're gaslighting me or whatever. And I'm like, and you got, you're I like, wish I had known what that meant back then, because that's what he was doing to all of us. But I, I just didn't know. I'm sure you didn't know. No, I, no, no. I had no idea. And it used to get under my skin that people would think that way. Of course, fast forward Maybe 10 years. Insane. That's one thing it, that I wonder, did it get to you? Cause now yeah. of course I think, oh my God, were we not right? And boy, has the world, I'm sure you've received more messages than I have, mm -hmm. but I get people in my inbox going, Hey, I hated you for years. I thought you were the problem. I see what Kane is like now. I see what Peter was. I get those messages all the time. It must feel, I don't know. Does it feel good to get those? Um, yeah, it does. I'm not going to lie. Um, I don't know. I mean, this makes me feel better hearing you say how much it bothered you because I thought it was just an issue I had. Oh. Like, when I, It drives me crazy when I'm telling the truth about something and somebody says I'm lying or somebody, you know, has a false perception that they're putting out there. And I'm like, but I know it's not true. It absolutely drives me nuts. Um but, you know, that goes back to what I was saying about focus on what you can control. You cannot control the other person and what they're doing. You know? So what was, I mean, we know the truth about your marriage. I mean, we know how truly difficult it was, but we don't ever know what Kane was like as a father. All we ever heard was just him on the radio and photos. So what was that like co-parenting and what was he really like as a dad to the girls? I mean, I'll. Uh I'll speak to what it was like when we were married together, because after we separated and co-parenting, um, I wasn't there. I only heard, you know, what the girls would tell me once they came home. And honestly, they were in fear a lot of the time to even tell me what was really happening. I found out a lot, you know, since then, since he passed, um, that I didn't know was going on at the time. But when we were together, he genuinely loved them. He really did. But I think because of his, whether it was his mental illness or his addiction, um, you know, he was never diagnosed with having, um, you know, a personality disorder, like a narcissism personality disorder. But there was something that he couldn't help that was wrong with his brain that got in the way of the girls ever being enough of a priority to be a truly good dad. But I think he, I think he did the best with what he could. And unfortunately, that best still hurt a lot of people. But I don't think Peter was a bad person deep at heart. I think he just, he just wasn't capable. And I think that's why God finally let him come home so he could be at peace. Because it was an awful way to live. 
you know, after he died, I had to go and clean out his house. And oh my gosh, the basement was just filled with paperwork, with records. Like he would compulsively keep printouts of every single thing, whether it was show prep, like the mountains of show prep, or it was PI reports on me or other show people that he was following or notes with attorneys. Like he was just, that poor man's brain was just like, no wonder he turned to substances to let him have a little bit of a release because he was just completely obsessed with, um, with, 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 you know, all of that, that was going on. Um, I know, isn't it? He never got to really feel peace. He never got to, I remember one of the times we were in therapy and I was telling the therapist marriage counseling, I was like, I just, I just want some time with him. You know, I want some time where we sit around the table as a family. And, you know, I'd always post these pretty dinners that I would cook, which you didn't know is we never sat down to eat them together because he would be on his phone or on his computer doing prep. And I was like, I just, I just want that time where, you know, you're laughing and joking. Peter couldn't enjoy that. I remember we made a deal with the therapist, like one hour, the girls and I would get one hour a day where he wouldn't be working, um, you know, in the evening and he, he couldn't do it. I think he wanted to, but he just, he, he just couldn't, he was so obsessed and his anxiety was so just, overwhelming that he couldn't even sit and enjoy those things that most of us take for granted. Isn't so so social media crazy? Because I did, after I left the show, not not long after you guys bought that mansion in Potomac, I was so jealous. I was so pissed. I thought, oh my gosh, were you really? Yes. I wanted him to not succeed the moment I left. I was so mad. And you know, you guys would just paint these beautiful pictures. And I think you had a Christmas party with maybe all the um, morning show people in your gorgeous mansion. And I thought, oh, fuck, he's doing well. <laughs> I have my Everybody own issues. Everybody was. I have my own problems. Did you tell <laughs> <laughs> I have my own jealousy issues. I was so mad. But isn't it funny how social media, I mean, you just have no idea what's going on in people's home. I thought you guys were happy, were rich. You lived in Potomac. You had this beautiful mansion and a Christmas party. And I thought, oh, they're loving life. Fuck. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Nope, 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 nope. And that's why I just um, yesterday I posted a picture of myself on Instagram with like no makeup on and looking all crazy and everything. And I was telling, you know, my followers on there, I just want to be real this time and authentic. I am so tired of this perfect little life that everybody portrays on social media because it's not real. And all it does is exactly what you just described. It makes everybody else think that their life is not good enough. But nobody's life is. Nobody's living like these perfect little filtered pictures. But yeah, that house was, that house was hell. It was beautiful and looked like everything we'd been striving for. I know. Miserable inside of it. And thank you for sharing that truth. And that also leads me to the sadness of what Kane's life was, because it's like, that's what we were all working so hard for. We thought, you know, was all these beautiful things. And damn it, he got it. And then it was like, to your point, a house of hell. That's yeah. All right. Tell me about how you found out. Cause how many years had you guys been separate? Well, divorced from when he died. It had been a long time. You'd remarry. I'm so bad at dates. So let's see. We separated in 2013, I think. And then finally divorced, um, maybe 2015 or so. Um, and he passed away. Um, 20, was it 20, 2020, 2021? No, 20, it wasn't 2019. Right, oh, right, I'm sorry. The pandemic started. No, 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 no. It's been a year and a half. Why are we so bad at math? Yeah, I know. Right. Okay. We're in 2022. It was 2020. 20, it would have been yeah, 2020. 20. Okay. Duh. 2020. Okay. Yeah. So you guys have been divorced and separated at least five years. Yeah. Well, Sarah, why are we so bad at math? 2021 <laughs> and we separated in 2015. So yeah, like six years, five, six years. How did you find out that he had died? Oh, um, okay. So 
I got a phone call, a FaceTime call at like 730 in the morning from Sam and the girls were not allowed to call me when they were with him. Um, they weren't allowed to have any contact with me. So even though they had cell phones, it was a condition of them having cell phones. So I knew something was wrong. And I was, I was sitting on the couch with Harry, my little one, you know, getting him up and ready for the morning. And my husband was there, you know, we're having our coffee and I answered the phone and she was sobbing that there was something wrong with daddy that he, um, that he was shaking, that he wasn't making any sense, that she couldn't get him up. So I had her carry the iPad over so I could see him. And he was just, um, he was laying on the floor on his side. And I said, um, okay, we need to call 911. I'm on my way over. And, um, I had to hang up the phone on the iPad because I was leaving the house and, you know, we wouldn't have Wi-Fi and I needed to call 911 and I hated leaving them alone like that. But, um, I called 911 to send them to the house and then called the girls right back while I was driving over there. It's, you know, normally like a 15 minute drive, but it was morning traffic. So it took me a little longer. And, um, you know, the girls were just panicked. I guess at some point he got up and sat in a chair because then when I talked to them again, he was sitting in the chair, but he wasn't, he wasn't really there, wasn't responsive and um, was just trying to keep them calm and, you know, tell them to let the fire department in when they got there. Um, And I got there right maybe a minute or two after the paramedics and fire department got there and I ran in and they had him sitting up in a chair in the other room and he looked normal and you know of course I grabbed the girls and hugged them and everything and I walked over to him and I was like Peter Peter what happened are you okay and he couldn't see me um you know he was looking my direction but you could just see he couldn't really see me um so they said that he had um he had had a seizure and sometimes after a seizure you can be confused um and that that's why and you know they were going to take him in and so at that point you know he left and the girls and I were there in the house and I remember his nanny showed up at that point also and um you have to understand I'm never allowed in that house you know that's the first time I'd ever even gone in there. And, um, I was there with the girls and, um, I remember the nanny wanted me to leave. And I said, no, I am, um, I am going through this house to find out what the hell is going on. And, um, I remember she tried to stop me and I just, I have never been so angry and just like, laser focused on this is it this finally ends because I had been telling people up until that point I had emailed his attorney and you know we were already divorced we didn't have any pending litigation I emailed his attorney I said you have to do something something is wrong he's you know there were so many red flags things that didn't make sense I was like he needs help um in regards to an addiction I mean we we yeah. heard it for years because before the show ended before he came off the show and I don't know if he was fired or I guess not renewed or paid to play, which basically just means like, we're going to pay you, but you're, you're done working for yeah. us. There were yeah, all kinds of things in a contract and they do that for many reasons. I have no idea what the catalyst was, but I mean, there, you know, I would get tweets is Kane drunk on air. Um, you know, and it's no secret. I mean, that a lot of things had leaked out. Um, you know, he was slurring on air. I mean, that's, public knowledge, you know, I mean, he was slurring on air at times for years before he finally got done. And I, I told you this, I mean, I was at gay pride parade, a few pride floats back and uh, I was getting ready to do the parade. And all of a sudden hot 99 fives float comes up and he's standing up there with a the microphone. I thought, Oh God, here we go. You know, I'm going to be like right in front of them. And the entire time he's going to be like hot 99 five, number one, number one, you know, reminding me of how awful I am. And anyway, he went off and berated somebody. Get the fuck off this floor. He went nuts. And I thought, oh 
my God, nothing has changed. And this was in public. And then all you saw was him disappear from the float. Never saw him again. And then, you know, the, the float went on. I don't even know what happened. I know like a week or two later, I think he wasn't on air for a week. Anyway, there were so many things leading up. So sad because the real Peter never would have done that. He would have kept it for him private, but he would never have done that. Gosh, well, the weirdest that part is like, him. in what, I don't even know why the universe put me in that moment to witness that after, I mean, this, this was like long gone. I was off the show. I don't know. That would have been, I don't know how many years ago, but anyway, I'd left the show. But to your point, what you're referring to is that you were warning people at that point before his death, that there was an addiction issue and nothing was happening is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was emailing everybody, you know, we still had, um, you know, people that were involved in our case, whether it was the attorneys or um, there were lots of therapists, best interest attorneys to represent the kids. There were so many people that stayed on payroll um, that I was just shouting to. I'm not the problem. I have been sober for years. He, somebody needs to help the girls, you know, he's clearly not sober and he just was able to, I don't know how, just make it go away, I guess, because he was paying everybody. Money. I, money. I, I don't know. Money. I don't know. People. And, and money. And I mean, I don't know how you felt, but I think even I saw in 2013, I mean, he was becoming a master gaslighter. I mean, it Gosh, was yeah. always... Sammy's crazy. Sarah is crazy. Mel, you, Danielle. I mean, it went on and on and on. Like, and so you combine that with fame, you combine that with money, you combine somebody who is a narcissist or whatever it was, combination of things. Highly like, manipulative. And I think people get to the point a little bit of maybe they're afraid of him, or it's like not my, not my monkeys, not my circus. You know, I don't, I don't want to know. Best of luck, stay away from me. You know, I. I don't know. I mean, these were people that were hired to be, to function in the best interests of the children. And even they wouldn't cross them and do it. So anyway, so at this point I'm in the house and I'm like, this is it. You know, I'm going to find whatever he's been doing. Cause I didn't know, is it alcohol? Is it pills? I just, I, I didn't know. And, um, and, and force him to get help. And so I went on a war path through that house and it was, it was so sad. I found like 23, I think, bottles of Grand Marnier, like huge bottles in places like in the, um, in the linen closet in the bathroom where the, t- behind the towels stuffed under the bed, um, all over the basement, um, just everywhere. And the pills that that one psychiatrist was writing, um, I still want to like, just say his name because he deserves to be recognized for all this, but I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. Um, he was still know. writing, he was writing ketamine. He was writing Adderall. He was writing Valium and Xanax. Like it was insane. And, you know, I, I told the, um, oh, I remember the param- The other reason I was doing this is the paramedic said, we need to know what he's on, you know, because some drugs can be contraindicated. We need to know how to treat him. So I said, okay, I'll find where his prescriptions are and I'll call the hospital and tell you. And so when I was Googling these drugs, like the ketamine, you're not supposed to be scri- prescribed that to take it home. It's only supposed to be used in like a hospital setting for severe depression. And one of the biggest warning sides on it on WebMD and all these websites is you don't combine it with alcohol. And if you think somebody's suffering from even mild alcoholism, this isn't a drug that they can take. And this is a man that was clearly having a large amounts of alcohol, severe alcoholism, and combining that with these drugs that will just kill your liver and kidneys. And that's, that's what, um, that's what ended up happening is, you know, I thought he was going to, I really thought, you know, okay, now I have all this, nobody can refute this, you know, I'm going to call my attorneys and I'll get temporary custody and he's going to be forced to do what happened to me, you know, however many years ago and, and finally get help. Um, and I really thought he was going to get better. Um, so I brought the girls home, brought Skittles home. And, um, that evening he, he had perked up and I was texting with him and, um, he wanted to FaceTime with the girls and 
that was the last time he was ever coherent was he FaceTimed with the girls and I think they were kind of mad at him and they were scared and, you know, it was a short call. I think they just weren't sure what to say. He was in the ICU with, you know, machines and, and IVs and everything else. But, um, you know, he told them how much he loved them and he tried to make them laugh. He could always make them laugh. And they said, I love you too. And that was the last time he was ever coherent. Um, I tried texting with him some after that. And I remember once I got a response about that he was on like a pirate ship, like he just, he wasn't making any sense. And at that point I was calling the hospital nonstop and I was still able to get information, you know, as you know, I said, you know, I'm his ex-wife, but I'm the mother of his children. And they would give me updates about what was going on. And um, I don't, know if he had a seizure or not. I think he probably did, but basically, um, and I'm not a doctor, so I'll just use my layman terms and understanding of this, but once your liver, you know, starts to, starts to have cirrhosis and stuff, um, it, it throws off all these chemicals and, um, you know, your kidneys stop functioning and you get jaundice, you know, he was very yellow. And once those levels get so high, it causes confusion. Um, and so they were trying to, trying to fix that, but it just, it just got so bad. It was one thing after the next. And then once his family got here, once his dad got here, um, you know, I wasn't able to talk to the hospital anymore. I had to get the information secondhand from his dad and his dad's a lovely man, you know, nothing there, but I just, I wanted to be the one, you know, talking with the doctors, finding out what to do, what are we going to do? You know, I, anyway, I, it just drove me crazy to have to sit back and just wait to get these kind of vague answers that really weren't answers. But um, then, yeah, I guess he developed a respiratory infection. Um, they think that when he like had his seizure that he um, aspirated on some of it, you know, when you can throw up yep. and it can go in your nose and down your throat and into your lungs. So he developed a respiratory infection and, um, and his kidneys were failing and it was just, he couldn't, he couldn't recover from it. And it was probably, gosh, I feel like he was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. I don't know if it was quite two weeks, but it was, it felt like forever. And there was at one point, you know, the first couple of days, I think I thought, okay, I'm going to have to fight this. He's going to be back on his feet, you know, trying to get out of this, but by all means, I'm going to force him to go and get help. And this is all going to change now. And after, I guess, those first couple of days, I started to actually get scared that he's not going to get the chance to get better. You know, I got a chance. I, would, I, I was at my rock bottom, but I got a chance. And he didn't, he didn't ever get that chance. Um, you know, he didn't, he didn't wake up again. So... You know, you talk about like your regret. My biggest regret of that I'll live with is that I didn't. I knew Peter better than anybody else on this earth. You know, I, his family is lovely and I'm sure they, they know him. They knew him since he was born, but I knew him as an adult since I was 19 and saw the real him. And, you know, I knew this man better than anybody else. I knew more than anybody else that he was sick and I never went to him in a spirit of weapons down, no lawyers. This is just me and you. I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm not going to take the kids away from you. I've been where you are and I want you to get help and I will help you to get help. And I never did that. I never came from like a place of love. I just came from a shouting to everybody else to do something about it and that's that's my biggest regret well god I, I i mean have you forgiven yourself i mean you know we all none of us did that i mean it, he was hard but to i knew up. more than it, i knew yeah I but knew more I mean, than anybody you, else knew you were also I didn't a, do it yeah but you were abused more than anybody else i mean you know he was a hard person to love. <laughs> you know, he was, I mean, there were moments, but it was, he was a hard person to go to with love. You just, I swear. It's like <laughs> the people that, you know, around him, it's like, I don't know if people will ever really know unless they were like 
around it like we were, but it was like, I don't know. You just never felt like you could ever let your guard down. You know, you never, you wanted to trust him. Like you wanted so bad because you knew there was like a, there, you knew he wanted to be good, but just, it, it, yeah. I hope you like, have you forgiven yourself? Cause I mean, honest to God, you shouldn't carry. I mean, ugh. yes and no. Um, no, in the sense that I still wish I would have done it, but I guess this isn't really forgiveness of myself, but I've just kind of made a piece that this was part of a bigger plan. And this was him find the way for him to finally be at peace, you know? Peter believed in God. He, he was a Christian and, um, you know, I believe he's in heaven. Um, his mom passed away not even a year later. And I think they're together and he's finally able to live in like that peaceful, loving moment. Like I was talking about around the dinner room, dining room table, um, that so many of us enjoy and he couldn't, and he's finally able to enjoy that, you know, every day. So, um, yeah, I miss him a lot. What's it First, like? I could only think about how angry I was. I was going to say, like, this, that he left the girls, that he was hiding such a big secret while he was yelling at me all the time that I had relapsed. There was something, you know, I was using again. And I was so angry for a while because the girls went through absolute hell. I mean, these are young teens losing their dad suddenly. Um, but now I just, I think about him every day and I, I think about the loving moments. I've never experienced intimacy with another person like I experienced with him. Like when we were younger, you know, we just really let each other know each other inside and out. And I miss him. I miss him. You know, he would do this funny little dance. I don't know if you, do you know what I'm talking about? Where he would shake his hands and kick his feet when he was really excited about something. <laughs> so I miss all that. I miss the, the happy parts of him. And that's all I think about now. I don't think about the anger and the horrible things he did. I don't know if that's just something that happens over time. or That's just a blessing from God that I can just think about the good things about him but you know the girls and I talk about all the time that we feel like he's still here it doesn't feel like he died we feel like he's just not here like he's on a trip somewhere <laughs> I don't know it just I don't know if that's because he was young and it was unexpected but it just doesn't feel permanent how yeah. are the girls doing how are I think everybody, I mean, we all saw them grow up. Like, how are they doing? They're doing good. Um, you know, they still miss him. Sophie just had a little breakdown last night. You know, she misses her daddy. She remembers, she doesn't remember a lot of the bad. She just remembers the good memories with him. Um, you know, she, she lets herself feel the grief. Um, Sam has had a harder time in the sense that, you know, feelings and wishy stuff doesn't come naturally to her. She's, you know, 14 going on 45. She's just incredibly mature and responsible kind of kid. So, um, you know, I think she still needs to process it at some point in her life. Um, cause she just kind of said, it was just like, okay, moving on. What's next? Yeah go to school, get my work done, you know, that type of reaction. But, you know, I think they're finally calm. You know, they don't, that fear that we've talked about over and over again about what's going to happen, Who, you know, what mood is he going to be in when he comes home? What trouble am I going to get in? It's still, I see like those gut reactions bubble up sometime. I mean, I still have it. I swear I have like PTSD from a lot of what I went through, but most of the time we're just able to be at peace and silly and happy and horrible TikTok dances that, you know, they do and try to teach me. And, you know, they adore their little brother and just have the best relationship with him. And it's mostly just normal day-to-day happiness. Oh my God. 
It's so good to hear that. God, you know, I thought going into this interview, it would be like fun. (laughs) fun. I'm looking at how many tissues. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. When do we get the fun part? Oh my God. Okay. Uh, We have to make the next half fun. Um, Wait, I do want to ask, I do want to ask you, what is it like? Cause I do think this will save a lot of people too. Okay, can you describe the feeling? What is it like when somebody that, like you said, it's like kind of has tortured you for so long, then like passes away? Because it's kind of like lots of times people like a lot have of people to, have asked me that. Lots of times you have to live with your tormentor for you know. I mean, maybe you don't live with physically with them, but they. Yeah, yeah. You know, I always say like you know, it's that saying, right? The good die young, and like it's like it's and sometimes <laughs> the other one. <laughs> Right. And the ones that aren't so good, like seem to hang on forever. And then when he passed, I'm like, I've talked about this with other people, like weird. I mean, because I it always thought- weird. I never thought it would end. I thought it would be until I was old that I would deal with that stress from him. And I would just it was just a part of my life. I mean, it it came into play with my second marriage. It was a big reason why it fell apart. You know, it was just I thought it was always going to be with that. And then then one day it's not. I always believed, I thought I'm going to go on and I'm finally going to get my talk show and I'm going to be famous. And he's going to leak some recording, do something. <laughs> He'll have something on me that I never even thought about. Cause you never could think ahead of him, you know, cause obviously uh-huh. our brains didn't work like that. I thought he'll just wait until my moment and he'll do something to try to destroy me. Like I always live with that. He never forgot. He never, never forgot. forgot. No, he had a grudge for everybody. Yeah. Everyone. Forever. Yeah. Forever. It's, um, it's, it's a weird thing. I was just talking with a friend about it, um, last night who just left her abusive husband. Um, and she was asking me that, and it's, it's a weird combination of the thing nobody wants to say, which is, I'm glad this happened. You know, you're not allowed to say that, but that's just being honest. There's a part of me and a part of the girls that are glad it's over, but we still want him back. You know, it's, um, it's not one you can totally make sense of that it, it made life better after he passed away, but we miss him terribly and still wish he was around. Yeah. I mean, look, I told you too, when we first reconnected, there was a part of me too that thought he'll have his rock bottom. He's going to take a couple years, get better. He'll go down to Tampa because he, he always wanted to move back to Tampa. He always. always wanted to go back and do mornings in Tampa. And I thought he'll find a radio station back in Tampa. He'll, you know, and I thought, I, I mean, I, I had crazy like vision shows like, oh, someday we'll do a reunion show. Like he'll get Did better. you really think that? <laughs> <laughs> you dream yeah. big. <laughs> I, I, you know what? My dreams are all over the place. Uh, I thought, yeah, you know, someday we'll do a reunion show. <laughs> and Sammy and Eric and, you know, Kane will come on my talk show and we'll talk about the beginning. All the good, the bad, the ugly. I, I had that. Yeah, I had it was like an Oprah show. Bless your heart. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. I'm, I'm out of tissues. Um, okay. But you did, you did recently post on your Instagram, single mom. So yeah, um, <laughs> apparently it's a role I'm good at. <laughs> All right. So tell us about that. What does that mean? What What's going you know, on? You know, the funny thing is when I was younger, you know, everybody always asks, what do you want to be when you grow up and you're in college trying to pick your major? And I didn't always say it because it wasn't like the cool thing to say, but I just wanted to be like married and a mom and have a family. I think it's, you know, daddy issues and stuff, but that's truly what I always wanted. I didn't really picture it without the husband part. (laughs) (laughs) I left that one part out, but you know, whatever. Whatever, you know, life manifests a little differently. But, um, you know, the funny thing is um, when I think about what I ever like get married again and stuff, um, I still believe in it after all this time of maybe not the word married and husband and wife, although I love being a wife, um, but just that, that idea of finding that match for you, you know, that other puzzle piece that you can grow old with. And Peter's always going to be, you know, a special part of my life. Um, We grew up together, you know, we spent 20 something years 
inundated in each other's lives, even though a lot of it was was bad. Um, you know, there there were parts of it that were good, and I and I do want to find that again one day. Oh, I feel like you will. I mean, you've look. I mean, you have conquered so much. I mean, so much. I mean, the next chapter of your life. And I think you know, I just turned forty in February, and it is true. It's like crazy. Like people, you know, you hear other women say this, like in different points of their lives. Like forty gets even better, and then fifty because you really do get to the point. You know yourself so well. If you've yeah. done serious work on yourself, you're you're getting fully healed, or you recognize like your triggers. And then lastly, you really get to the point. You don't give a fuck. You don't right? care what people say. You don't care about other people's opinions. I'm getting to the point, like my appearance is only for me. I really don't, I'm beyond those yeah. years of like having to be 20 and hot. And, you know, am I going to, you know, <sighs> and you just like, it, like it is, women are just so powerful, the older they get and the wisdom, you know? So I know for you, you're going to find that partner. And to me, I'm excited for you. Cause I feel like you're going to be such a healed person and oh. you know, you I are the best thing is like when you're healed, you attract a healed person. Like you, you're a woman that you want someone that's enhancing your life. No more, you oh know. Oh my goodness, yes. No more somebody I need to take care of. Oh no, <laughs> I want to be taken care of. It's oh no. yes, but you someone know, that just brings you back. You know, even up more. Amen. Um, but I'm in no rush. You know, right now this is the first time since you know I goodness, I got engaged when I was 26, had Sam by 28. This is the first time in my life where, you know, the three kids are in school. I'm not having to worry about somebody else that, you know, I'm doing their laundry or cooking their dinner or whatever. Like I get to focus on me and what I want to do. And that is insane. And, you know, for the first time in my life, I want to do that. I didn't really want to focus on myself before. I think I, I was lost about who I was. Um, so it was easier to take care of somebody else. But I am just so excited to be where I'm at today because I'm, I'm happy. I'm content. I'm fulfilled. And anything that adds on to it right now is just frosting, you know? Oh, my God. Hell yeah. Just keep basking in how great it is. Like, you deserve all that. Now remind me this tomorrow when I'm, you know, grumpy and going, I'm so lonely. Um, okay, but but what is next? I mean, what is next? You you've wanted to be a wife. You wanted to be a mom. You're growing up these beautiful children. You are finding you. You've also been an artist, a writer. Um, so what is next for Natasha? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, let me, let me dial into that a little. I don't know exactly what it's going to be right now. I'm excited to be creating my art. You know, I have an Etsy shop, Little Pink Monsters that I'm getting ready to relaunch and I love doing my art. It's, you know, it's going to be extra cash, cash flow, which will be awesome. But I don't see myself doing that as like the big picture, everything, um, I don't know if I ever told you this, like I went to school for television journalism and I worked in radio before. Um, so I would like to somehow use this, this platform that I kind of stumbled into, um, but I now have to somehow tell my story in a way that like, you know, how we started this off that helps other women who are finding themselves in where I was five years ago, 10 years ago, um, all of this pain, there has to be good that comes from it. And God has given me this, this amazing point in my life where he has brought me through, you know, the horrible crying on the bathroom floor, not being able to see the light that could happen moments into this woman who is strong and comfortable and confident and has learned so much. And I just want to use that for good. And I'm not sure if People have been asking me, you know, on my Instagram to be blogging again. I don't know if anybody blogs anymore, <laughs> if anybody reads blogs anymore. I love to write, but um, maybe, you know, like a podcast is a better way to get, you know, we covered a lot of the story, but not a lot of, there's so much more in the nitty gritty moments and the lessons that I've learned. So I still have to figure out the medium for how I'm going to do it. Um whether it'll be like a memoir or, you know, a bunch of small podcasts, but I have to use this 
um, this blessing of healing for good. I have to. Oh my God. What's the point of all of it? You know? Oh, well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I agree. Right. Isn't that what life is totally about? Like using our experience and talking about it and Oh my God. I mean, I just, I get, like I said, I get goosebumps. I ripple like at who knows who this will touch this podcast episode. Exactly. Exactly. I remember when I was, when I was writing my blog and I would, you know, pour my heart out on the page and put that vulnerability out there. But then the comments would be other women who were going through the exact same thing and saying, you know, this touched me, this helped me heal. This helped me feel like I was just not alone. Like that. Oh like that, that makes me want to cry is like knowing that can make somebody else feel not alone because I know how lonely I felt before. Um, so I, I don't care about, you know, fame or stardom or anything big like that. I just, I just want those little moments, um, to continue. Ah, I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited for you. I just, and look, my advice is always do the medium that you love that you're going to continue doing and they will come because I'm not a writer. So that's why I just like have to turn on a microphone. I can't write shit. I can't, I don't have the patience or the time. I cannot. So it's like, do what? And you know, when I started my podcast six years ago, no one listened to podcasts. People told me I was nuts. I couldn't get any advertisers. The advertisers didn't even know where to find a podcast. And now six years later, you know, everyone has a podcast. So right. if, if the love is writing, right, they will come and all the, you know, good that you want from it will come. And then maybe you launch a podcast too, but do what you love. I mean, I think people just, that resonates with people so much and they feel it when you post and they felt it in this podcast. I can tell, I mean, I felt it. Like I told you, I, I have goosebumps, like thinking about this podcast, just I hope so. I genuinely ah. hope so. I mean, I think we covered it all. I mean, I think we did. I think we did. You know, it's just life is, you know, life is a bunch of just making the next right small decision in front of you. And so, you know, when you ask me what's next, I don't have like some big giant answer of what my dream is because I just want to make the next small right decision because one small decision leads to another, which leads to another. And today it was doing this with you and we'll see where that goes. And I'm just going to keep following the breadcrumb trail. You know, that's how God teaches us just with a breadcrumb trail. Well, I'm honored um, that you would trust me, put your trust in me. I'm glad we reconnected. You know, we reconnected after Kane's death. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to reach out to you. I sent you girls a card. You know, I lo- you know this. I lost my dad, different situation, but when he had cancer when I was 14. So I, you know, love the girls. I feel like what they're going through is so hard. And it took me like 10 years later to process those feelings. Like I actually, when I was kind of, before leaving the cane show. But once I started therapy, I really like dealt with that grief. And then that also led to the confidence to leave the show. And, and you would ask me this too, why did you leave? And part of the reason too, is I've always wanted to be on TV. I've always wanted to be a talk show host. Like that's why I'm here in LA. You know, I mean, there were other things too. It was time for me to move on, but, um, I just, you know, I love it. I'm so proud of you. I'm honored that I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited for you. You know, I I mean, like I I genuinely love and adore you, Sarah. I always have. It's just, there's something special about you and you're just so darn lovable. Well, I have always felt the same about you and I hated to, you know, leave, you know, not connect with you. And I knew, you know, I knew at the time you were married to Peter, you had to, obviously you picked him, you know, I mean, I wasn't asking you to pick any, you know, I'm saying like, I should have picked you. We could have had such a life together. <laughs> no, and then, you know, we, I was so mad at you too. Cause we briefly reconnected. Remember when you guys were getting divorced and, yeah. um, you know, Peter found out we were texting and then contacted Ooh, my it was me, you and Danny. No. And, and Mel, yeah, and my attorney, I didn't know that. Me. Yes, my attorney called me and he said, Jeez. I have heard that you have been talking to Natasha. And he's like, do not, he's like, stop, stop. You don't, you know, you don't want Kane, you do not want to get back involved with Kane and you don't know what he could do. He's Kane. So that ended that. So then I was like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to, you know, I'm done. I, you know, yeah. So it was, you know, but anyway. I'm it's glad okay, though, because it's fine. And look where we are now. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, exactly. It was all timing. And one day the girls and I will come out to California and we'll come and stay with you. Or better yet, I just, I'm going to go on a trip by myself. One day when the girls have something to do, I'm going to come out and stay with you and we will just have a fantastic time being free. Being free. Um, Where can people follow more of you today? For now. Uh, so if you want to go back and read my old post, Little Pink Monsters, plural monsters, is still up and running. Um, my Etsy shop is Little Pink Monster. It's not quite open yet, but it will be soon. But the best place is Instagram at Ms. Pink Monster, MS Pink Monster, because I post everything on there and then you know I'll tell you where to go next. But that that's where I post all the day-to-day little nuggets and um yeah, if you want to know what's going on with the girls and I and our little psychopath Harry, it's not just the girls anymore. Um, <laughs> that's the best place, man. And I, I want to meet more people. So if you liked what you heard, I'd love to hear from you and broaden the circle of um, these amazing women that I've met online. Oh my God, love you. Wish you all the I best. Love you.